Hello, everyone. Welcome to Breakfast with the CEO, a she podcast hosted by myself, Matt C. Smith, and Ilya Oftedal. It's better she says it because she says it yes. correctly. <laughs> but this morning, uh, I'm very excited. I know that uh, Ilya is too, and I hope you are too at yeah, home yeah. because we have a guest who, you, know, you are the queen of pivots. You've pivoted a lot in your life, haven't you? And what stands out to me as we're going to discuss today is a little bit about those pivots, how you started off as a sort of champion concert celloist, uh, you know, scholarship, university, Harvard, Oxford, uh, lacrosse player. And uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but you are very much the one of the first cr kind of uh, creators, instigators around pop ups, right? Yeah. In the retail space. Yeah. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for. Jen Lee Koss. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what an intro. <laughs> Firstly, mm -hmm. what did you have for breakfast this I morning? I did. I had two pieces of toast. Um, with? One, one with jam and one with brunost. Delicious. I want to pick up with the pivots. Yeah. You know, like uh, after reading about you, I find you as like a true explorer in a way. That's the red thread when it comes to the pivots, mm -hmm. I think. And normally it's... Uh, people are very scared of doing pivots in life, mm. especially here in Norway. You know, people stick to one path. Yeah. So I would like to ask you, like, what triggers you? Why pivot so much? Yeah, it's a great question. This is very deep. <laughs> it's very deep, straight into the deep um, stuff. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a couple of things about the pivot. One is it could be that you are presented, like, with a fork in the road in your life where you have a really, you know, huge decision to make where you're saying like do I go this way or this way and then you kind of have to go with your gut and then go with your head so both so you could be presented with something and then make a decision so that could be a pivot but the other thing that I find interesting is that with a pivot is that it could be an answer that had been there all along but you didn't know and then it presents itself and then you're sort of like yeah, yeah actually that 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 is the direction actually that I've been going in anyways and now I'm just gonna really turn my attention towards that and and double down on it so one is like so one is where you present it, it presents itself and the other is where it was always there because I read that since you were a child you wanted to become a professional celloist I did and and, and then you become a professional celloist <laughs> and then all of a sudden you change your path like yeah. what happens how's well, the process like so it's interesting because of course you can always look at things you know in hindsight and say this is how it now I understand why these things happened. But of course, being a cellist for me was always somewhat in my cards because my mother was a professional uh, pianist. So she was a classical pianist. One question. Yeah. What is a cello? What is a cello? It's not a, it's not a, it's not a um, violin. It's a big violin. No, it's a violin. <laughs> it's in the violin family. Okay. Um, it's in the string, four string instrument family. So there goes the violin and then the viola, which is slightly bigger, also played like the violin. Then there's the cello played, you know, upright where Huge. you're sitting, yeah? yeah. And then there's the bass, which is where you're standing or kneeling on a um, stool and sort of playing. So there's different sizes. But the cello, I think, is, I of course am biased, but is the most beautiful instrument of the string family because it actually is within the range of the human voice. So oh. it actually speaks to you and speaks to a lot of people. And it's also quite um, anthropomorphic, meaning like it's like shaped like a human body. And then you sort of, when you play it, you sort of are holding it like a human. So there's a lot of really beautiful things about the instrument. That's fascinating. <laughs> I never heard that before, but it makes right. so much sense. Yes. Like, I, I always thought like, why cello? cello I know. You know it like, is a very difficult just, instrument. Yeah. So, and so my mother, who was a pianist, had always, she did this like, insanely smart reverse psychology thing with me <laughs> when I was growing up where she was like you know I think most Asian parents don't want to stereotype but I'm just saying will start their children really early in music you know when they're like three two three four and they're like little and they're just going crazy with these finger <laughs> gymnastics and my mother was very anti that and she would 
constantly say, no, you cannot play a stringed instrument until you're big enough, until you're old enough. And then she played it out until I was about 10. And she was like, and when I was even seven or eight, like she took me to concerts all the time. And then I just, oh, please, can I play now? No, 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 you can't play until you're big enough. That's and so then true. when I turned- like reverse psychology. Yeah, <laughs> totally. She wants yeah. you to play. She's like, you can't play. I want it because I can't have it. I know. Yeah. So then of course, when I was 10, I was like ready to go. And my mother was like, here you go. And here's your cello. Oh, and then yeah. I really, I like dove in yeah. and hard. So I was able to like focus and I really wanted it and I wanted to play. And I had also been around it my whole life. So that's kind of how I started. Mm -hmm. And then I took it seriously, as I said, from the minute I started. And I was going to extra school on Saturdays at a school called Juilliard, which is a you went to Juilliard. I know that from the arts. movies. Yes, uh, from the movies. It's true though. I, it's, 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 I mean, like Harvard, Oxford as well, and they're internationally acclaimed, right? But Juilliard, I swear, that's what movie have I seen that in? Yeah. I don't know, but anything related to music, probably or dance. Or Admit acting. it. You listening at home right now? You've also you know Juilliard, Juilliard from the movies. Yeah. It's probably Glee or something. Anyway. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Uh, so, and I went there from when I was ten until I was eighteen. But I think that even though I was very focused on my music. I was also I was also interested in a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. I was interested in sport. I was interested in just like schoolwork and studying and all the normal things that, you know, a child does when they grow up. And and luckily my parents allowed me to do all those things in addition to having that sort of separate pocket of time, which maybe now that I think about it, I never thought about this before. I feel like I'm in therapy. I feel like this is probably why I feel like I can have so many hats on all the time or like this idea of having the capa like unlimited capacity to do things because I was doing so many things already as a child and really sort of com compartmentalizing those things. Like I had my music and I would go on Saturdays and then I had school and then I had this. And so I think... I think maybe and also your parents like encouraged you. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, totally. They weren't like sit on your chair, practice all day. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I had some of that in, innately in me that mm -hmm. I wanted to do it, yeah. but I also was encouraged to do a lot of other things. But then, like your professional cellos, and immediately you just like changed. Yeah. Like why? Like what happens in that so second? So I was twenty six when I gave up my cello, like cold turkey. I had been studying, as I said, so I had studied very intently until I was 18. I graduated high school. I um, was very into playing a sport called lacrosse, which is not a big deal here. Break it down to me and everyone, I think, listening. Lacrosse to us <laughs> Nordic people. I mean, I've seen some players doing lacrosse in uh, lacrosse in, 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 in uh, Mayurstua really? and, yeah, in, in Frogner so, Park, there, yeah. actually. It's not that known. It's yeah. not that known there, but ah. how does that sport work? <laughs> Is it like... It's like it's Quidditch. A, it's like... <laughs> Almost. Come on. It's a little bit. Just you flip it it's around. Like instead, of, instead of having a broomstick, you flip it around. Yeah, and you you make a net. A net. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. you play with that. It's, it's like... Um, is it like hockey kind of? But but in yeah, you have a stick with a net on it. Yeah. yeah. And you're... It's so funny. It's yeah. Quidditch. Yeah, it's Quidditch. It's Quidditch. No, yeah. Let's go with Quidditch. <laughs> okay. Let's go with that. <laughs> Anyways, it's a sport. It's a lot of running and it's a lot of stick skills and things. Anyways, it's quite big in the Northeast where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I just love that sport. And I played it a lot. So I actually wanted to play that sport in university. And, you know, when you're wanting to play a sport in university, you have to be recruited and you have to coaches watch you and all this kind of stuff. And again, my parents were very... I did all the right things, meaning I you know, went to, to athletic camps and I went to lacrosse camps in the summer and I did all kinds of stuff. Anyways, um, but I applied early to Harvard and I got in, which was amazing, which Parents is like great. proud. Yeah, yeah. early action. <laughs> and yet I still had this like yearning to continue my cello studies. And I didn't know how to quite reconcile that because mm -hmm. at the time Harvard did not have this. They now have a dual degree with New England Conservatory. So you could actually go and do both, which would have been my dream. Um, but I had also been studying with a professor who was in Germany at the time. And I'd been going every summer to like Switzerland and France and playing and doing all these things. And he had said, I would like you to come study with me at this conservatory I'm at, which is in Freiburg in Germany. And I said, oh, okay, I guess. I don't know. And then again, I fork in the road. I was sort of like, I got into university early, but I also have this opportunity to go study at this music you, you know, um, conservatory. What should I do? And so my gut was like, oh, I should just go to school because no one really took gap years at the time. And 
it was it was honestly very strange. And in the U.S., it still isn't as accepted, I think, as it is maybe in the U.K. or in elsewhere in Europe. But all my friends were going to university. And then I went to go see the lacrosse coach, actually, at Harvard, who had recruited me. She wanted me to play on the team. And I told her, I, I'm committed. I want to play on the lacrosse team. I'm ready to go. And she said, which I'll never forget, and I totally attribute it to her, she's like, Jen, Harvard will always be here. You know, you're not, yeah. you're not missing anything. These walls, like these brick walls will always be here. You just go. You just go for a year and do what you need to do. And I was like, done. And I just kind of needed to hear it from somebody else. And the fact that she would say, and doors are open, and you can play on the team when you get back, and don't worry, and just go. And so I did. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was sort of like my first real move to try something different, really focused on music. And then I ended up going back to school and going back to Harvard, and I played in the lacrosse team. I did all my things. And then I started to dip my toe into business, mm. which is... As well, going back to that yeah. point, I mean, that's the, what stands out to me um, from that point is you had a risky option and a yeah. you know, less risky option, a safer option, right? Yeah. And that comment from, you, from your coach there was like, the safe option will always be there, the risky yeah. option might yeah, not, right? Yeah, totally. Yes. So you always have a fallback that's consistent. Many people don't think about that. Yeah. yeah. They don't understand, like you can always go back to school. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that that comes up later when you think about other pivots that you can make where you're like, oh, but it's so risky. But the fallback is I'm hireable, you I know. know. Mm. Like, well, I'll be okay if things don't work out. So anyways, there's, you're right. And I think it is, again, just someone encouraging you to think about that mm. um, and giving you the reassurance that you can do it. I mean, I think my parents were always saying that, but I just needed to, I needed some other sort of voice that I really respected to say that to. Is that sort of your biggest lesson from all these transitions or pivots? Or what is your biggest lesson from them? Oh my goodness. Um, that's a great question. What is my biggest lesson from all these pivots? Um, Never pivot again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I literally like, don't do it. No. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I would say, I think you should be open to pivots. I think there's something about just your... Um, it brings life into your yeah. life in a way. Yeah. Like, I think it's just something about like a capacity to stay in the moment and flexible. You know, not rigid all the time about this is what I think things should be like and this is how it's going to be. And if it's not this, then, you know, and just being disappointed if things don't work mm -hmm. out. But I think when you pivot, if you're open to pivots, then you're open to a lot of things. You're open to, I'm like, this sounds really hokey and really weird, but you're open to signs. <laughs> That's yeah. another podcast. It's down the road. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Yeah. That's Kate's. Uh, where that's are the Kate's, crystals? Uh, Kate's, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, really? I was yeah, like, where yeah, are the we, crystals? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yes, yes. Room. yeah no, well, go, uh, What do you think of the room? Yeah, you think yeah, exactly. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But actually, on pivoting, you know, just for the benefit of me, um, and I know uh, some people listening definitely pivot. This, it's a buzzword we use to describe changing e direction, basically. Yeah. And that, it's Especially usually... in business. It, it's yes. Specifically, well said earlier, it's specifically within business, and it's typically used to describe describe uh, whether you change, for example, you're a B2B, which is business to business, yeah. so you sell to businesses, yeah. and you decide to sell to customers, yeah. so you B2C, it's called, the buzzword yeah. there. I wrote the book on buzzwords, literally, so um, <laughs> uh, I should have brought one for you, actually. Uh, anyway, but uh, the point is that you know you change from B2B to B2C, right? You change yes. business model, or you change yeah. industry, and in, in the case of being an individual, it's, yeah, like you've said, changing from being a musician, a sports yeah, player, exactly. to this, to that, the other you know school university yeah um and i said uh, from now on pivot means just change your direction again. changing yeah. direction <laughs> yeah no it is yeah it's direction changing direction changing mindset because i think if you stay rigid and you don't stay open to opportunity maybe that's the thing pivot is being open to opportunity, opportunity. and take um, it exactly and being being open to making magic happen you know some people are like oh you're so lucky or things and you're like no, no. actually you make your own luck you know exactly. you are you're open to things you're open to signs you're open to connections you're open to people and then you know and then you can make stuff happen but um i lost my train of thought have you had any pivots because <laughs> we were speaking about pivots that have worked for you right yeah. been very successful for you <laughs> in different retrospects yeah um have you had any pivots that you massively regretted? <laughs> mm. Oh my gosh. We all have. I know that. I can say, I can list a piece of yeah, paper yeah. <laughs> right now <laughs> well, from this morning. Them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, 
No, I don't know if I have like any true regrets. I mean, I think that I have a lot of lessons learned, you know. I've had lots of times where I feel like I've fallen on my face. But this is the thing about pivots, which is pivots to me also feel like it's about experimentation and testing, you know. So that to me I think is like a really – that's the part that is is great because you can you can test and you can experiment without taking so much risk, whether it's monetary or whether it's your time or whether it's capacity, whatever it is. And you can test and you can see. It's almost like you can nibble and like, is that going to work? Like, I don't know. And then you can immediately make a pivot and you can decide, okay, that, that didn't work, so now I'm going to move. You can get far down a rabbit hole, you know, in some ways too. You can test the hell out of something and think – but I was so hypothesis first. Like, I really thought this was going to ha- happen, and it didn't. And I'm still trying to prove that it can, and that's a trap. But so, yeah, I mean, like, do I regret those things? Possibly. But I do think that if you're in that sort of pivot mode, you're just testing. You're trying. And and everything can be a mistake, but it's not like a massive, like, the world is over. I can never get out of this kind of mistake. It's like a, oh, shoot, like, I really effed up. And now I'm going to learn and take whatever I took, you know, whatever mistakes I made there, and I'm going to try and apply it to the next thing I do. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking, like, I would never be the person I am today yeah. if I didn't pivot that much. If I didn't, like, uh, that's that's actually what – I'm not reg- regretting anything either yes. because I wouldn't be the person I am. Yes. You know? Totally. I think think that is the – that's a really good thing with the pivots. Uh, but into business a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, know, yeah? Um, you actually also, all of a sudden, you, I, I heard that you changed, changed a job for one year. And yeah. when you get into that job, it doesn't take any long before you start becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah. Like, what happens? Ha, ha, ha. How did you get there? That is so true. Yeah. Chasing I mean, a job for like I one did year. Chase a job. And then, I, like, so there was a job that I really wanted, actually. I was living in London working for a management consulting company and I really wanted to work at a different consulting firm called the Bridgespan Group. They're sort of like a the nonprofit arm of Bain and Company, which is a very large consulting company. And I had heard about this company for a, for a little while. They're quite new at the time. And when I joined, there were for sure less than 20 people, so it was very small and very new. But I had heard about this thing and I was like that thing like that job that job sounds like an amazing job and so I kind of got on top of it like I was sort of like I want to learn more about it and then I got ahead of it because then I started like pinging this partner there and I was like hello <laughs> I was like you don't know me yet but well, you, you will, will. <laughs> but when like, you say pinging and you go hello did you show up and go then that's probably yeah. why you didn't get it for a year no, exactly. he's like hello, hello. I'm Jen yeah. he's like I have hard, a wife hard, hard. Yeah, I have children sketchy. yeah no I um I no I literally cold emailed I I was like very actively trying to figure out ways to get connections into this place and so um one of the partners there I just found and I I think we maybe had some warm contact somebody we knew on LinkedIn who knows but I just emailed him and then I kept emailing him and I kept checking in hi it's Jen I work at Parthenon which is a different consulting firm which you know about and I love your firm and I really love to like Got to get an opportunity one day to work there. And if there's anything that's open, please let me know. Like, I'm so game. And I just kept on, like, checking in over a course of time. And finally, he wrote me back and was like, you know what? We have an opening for this, like, associate position. And would you like to apply for it? And I was like, yes. Oh, my gosh. That was and a year so, after you sort of letting yeah. them know that you were interested, being proactive. Totally. But that's a lesson there. Again, I mean, being proactive. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I swear. I have – that's, like, one of my – biggest things which I love to tell people is like have no fear of the cold email because honestly the 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 you already expect to know right so when you write that you're like ugh, is Oprah really gonna write back to me no nah. but then you, more you, often than not she's right back we actually quite close <laughs> <laughs> imagine that but she has a great uh, podcast actually but, uh. <laughs> but then, you know more often than not they write back and then that's kind of where it comes in, where it kicks in, where you make your own magic and luck happen and you do something with that. But, you know, I just was reading, and this is, again, I don't know if you guys know Yayoi Kusama. No. She is one of the most prominent female artists in the world, still alive. She's Japanese. She makes these things, actually, at... The, the dots? 
It's, yes. yes. It's oh, her, her of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And she also makes infinity her. rooms with mirrors. Yes, yes, it's very yeah, cool. Very Instagrammable. Yeah. She was sort of ahead of her time. That's why we know it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> so she, um, she's amazing. Anyways, you know, she's she's literally just one of the most world's, well, most well-known al alive female artists. Anyways, I just read her autobiography. I was so moved. And she when she was in her early 20s, wanted to get the hell out of Japan as an artist. And so the only thing she could think of doing was writing a letter to Georgia O'Keeffe, who, as you know, was another very prominent U.S. American mm -hmm. artist at the time, because she was like, I really love her. She's amazing. She's famous. And I'm going to write her a letter and tell her that I'm a Japanese artist and I really want to get to the United States. She literally, like, ships this letter. I mean, imagine back then in the time. Sends what what this era letter. is this? Or this is in the fifties? Um, or let's see, it would have been. Well, let's see. She's like ninety, so wow. anything from the yeah forties yeah, to the sixties, exactly. I guess. Or yeah. so maybe maybe in the sixties. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually like right before the hippie times. So okay. Yeah. Okay. So fifties. And yeah. she she sends this letter off into the ether. Well, not into the ether, but like on a <laughs> ship. You know, like it takes forever to get there. And Georgia O'Keeffe actually receives the letter and then writes her back and says. Yes, I'm come, come to the United States. And that is the entire reason why her career wow. actually took off. Yeah. One letter. One letter. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, so but it amazing. says it all. You know, it you should just totally like, she does. perhaps didn't even expect an answer. You know? No, of course not. She's like writing a fan, fan letter. I mean, it was crazy. I love it. So that's what you picked up on. Yes. I was like, that is, yes, that is just kismet. Like, yeah. that's how the world works. Yeah. You know, you put yourself out there. You have to put yourself out there. You have to be a little bit vulnerable. And and then maybe you hear something, but then you do something with it, right? I, I had a um, similar recommendation to me when I was, and this is going back in time now, uh, a decade ago when I was, you know, leaving my after my master's, trying to get a job. And I think that's like actually quite relevant today. Yeah. Because obviously, you know, let's be honest, the climate we all live in, anyone um, looking for a job right now is in a, you know, it's, yeah. it's a buyer's market, if you will, right? Because yeah. um, you're lucky to have one if you have. But I was recommended when I was, you know, trying to differentiate myself to uh, back in the day when I was applying to Goldman Sachs, actually, uh, yeah. a place where we used to work and other and com uh, companies like Morgan Stanley, where I ended up going actually yeah. for a period of time. I wrote letters directly to hedge fund managers and things like that. So yes. KK, K, uh, KKR, yeah. I wrote to them. Or and You're I like, got a response. Henry Kravitz. I literally <laughs> did. I wrote to the, these sort of very influential individuals yes. who are billionaires and yes. super successful, but uh, don't take calls, don't take meetings. And I wrote them letters. I, I found out relatively easily where they lived. Yeah. So if anyone needs to know yeah, where anyone lives. <laughs> I literally did because I, I wrote them at home, which was the differentiating wow. factor. And I and you know what? I, I mean, I didn't get 99% of those jobs, but at least I stood out. And totally. I did get a response from uh, one of the head guys of KKR, yeah. big private equity fund based in London, well, actually around the world, yeah. I mean, one of the biggest in the world. And I got a response from him and he said, hey, Matt, you know, really appreciate the personal touch. Uh, you know, and then the classic kind of market uh, HR department response. You know, we we put your you know, right. CV in the, right. in the, in but the, you were like, in the ether. Yeah. <laughs> we'll never talk to you again. But yeah. but kudos. Yeah. Um, but then that worked out for me actually, and I ended up did, did, ended up actually getting a job uh, through that through that kind See, of strategy. Yeah. And I've done the same. I never. I've always asked for all of the jobs that I got. Like yeah. I, I only during this one, she begged me. She was knocking on the door. <laughs> <laughs> So we actually just, I mean, she wasn't yeah, meant to be. It's just this morning. She, yeah, exactly. <laughs> She's like, take me. No, but it is like, I've always asked, like, hey, can I work here? I really want to work here. And then yeah. I got the job. Like, I only applied for one job yeah. in my life. And listen, of course, not every instance is that going to work out. Yeah, of course, but you, you should know. just try. You should at least. just try. You know? Uh, yeah. But but yeah, then, then you uh, end up becoming an entrepreneur. Yes. Like, how does that happen? I actually think, I mean... So then, of course, as I said, like in hindsight, I can look back and say there was there was a thread of or at least this um, of entrepreneurship that I had my entire life. I've always had big ideas and wanted to start things and have started things, even though I never may have called that like entrepreneurship. I just thought that was great. Greater. Yeah. yeah. Like doing something that I didn't see existed I think is the main thing it's like you know what that doesn't exist why doesn't it exist I don't know well I should just make it happen um, and never really thinking too much about okay how do I make that happen and then now I'm going to write my 10-year business plan and then I'm going to do everything that says that I'm supposed to make you know reading how do I make it happen no it was just like what are those tiny little steps that I take to make something happen 
it starts with an email, then it starts with bringing somebody on board, and then it starts with doing this, and literally just so that it snowballs, and then you realize this is a thing, yeah. you know. Yeah. But I think, yeah, with entrepreneurship in terms of starting my own business down the road, I think it started with actually meeting a person who I thought, you know what, I could totally do something with this person. So it's one of those serendipitous yeah. moments where you sort of bump into someone. How did you meet this person? Oh, personally? my gosh. This is another sort of gen – Jen scary stalker thing, which is <laughs> I was reading a lifestyle blog. I was like working in private equity and I was like rah, 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 making models all day, like boiling the ocean. Financial making, models, DCFs. Yeah, ah, just going crazy. A lot, a lot of you listening will know a lot about those things. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, and then I was on the side, I was reading these lifestyle blogs, you know, like about home decor and like style and all these things. So Early days like, of Pinterest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was just a bit, you know, just kind of doing stuff on the side. And then I read this blog and I was like, wow, this is a cool blog. I really like the voice of this blog. This girl sounds amazing. And I read her bio and I was like, oh my gosh, she lives in Toronto. And at the time, you know, I'd been in Toronto. So I emailed her. I was like, hi, this is Jen. You don't know me yet I was like but I would really love to take you out for a coffee and she responded and was like great let's do it and so we met for a coffee and the minute I met her and it's funny because we actually traced this back down the line and then we saved the email after because we literally wrote, wrote each other emails after being like are you thinking what I'm thinking but now we're on to the entrepreneurial journey of yeah. Jen Lee mm -hmm. Cost. Now, mm -hmm. Jen, we, now, we're, now this is interesting, right, yeah. to me, because you've touched on it a little bit now about e-commerce and, and yeah. retail specifically, right? So your hobby mm -hmm. at the time was reading um, lifestyle blogs yes. and yep. things like that, right, whilst you're working in financial industry, doing due diligence yes. for uh, private equity funds <laughs> and, and crazy, uh, highly intellectual things. Um, and you were your hobby was looking and meeting these individuals. So you met one of these individuals. Yes. Uh, this this lady, can we yes. know her name? Her name was Kana. Kana. Kana Paranchape. And what was the blog called at the time? Um, in Life and in Fashion. In Life and in mm -hmm. Fashion. So you, 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 you're you interested in this lady. You, you reach out, you send the, you know, our email example, you send the email, she says yes. Um, you feel this sort of connection to do something, right? You yeah. didn't jump at it straight away, did you? No, I, I mean, I didn't even know. I just knew that I liked it was a lot about the voice and the way that she curated products on her site. I was like, she chooses amazing things. I love all of them. And I like the way that she writes, which I intuitively knew was just a way that she thought and a way that she talked. So I was like, I, I need to meet this woman. Um, and then I met her, and it was true. I mean, it was so funny because we talked, and then she noticed, wait, here's someone who comes with a completely different background from myself, yet we were both from sort of the consumer retail world. Like I had been investing in consumer retail companies. I had been doing private equity due diligence for them. She had come more with like ops, retail ops, online marketing. She had run um, and started this like entire concept store in Canada that was around eco-friendly high-end paper, which 10 years ago was like, what? But today actually would be very relevant. So it was almost like way ahead of its time. Um, and then we thought, yeah, you know, there's, there's this there's something going on. <laughs> we have to figure this out. But what is it? We didn't know. And so that's when we started, as I said, giving each other homework. Let's figure out what it is that we could do together. You, you hadn't decided to what? I mean, you hadn't said, hey, we're going to start something together at this point. You were like, let's, yeah. there's something here. There's something here. And let's meet again. Let's meet again. Let's meet again. But there was this, as I said, this innuendo, like with the email after we met, which was, are you thinking what I'm thinking? You know, should we do something together? It was like dating, you know. I felt like we were just starting to get to know each other and to figure out whether there was a there there. And by the way, partnership in business is – it's – it's so complicated, you know. And most people think, oh, she's my best friend. I'm going to yeah. go into business with her. It'll and, be well, all work out. Yeah. Let's <laughs> things 50-50. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, when things go really bad, you know, we're we friends because yeah. we're such good friends. Exactly. You know? It'll never not uh, work out because we're best friends. Yes, exactly. Um, I don't know why I did an accent. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. What, <laughs> yeah, what are you, Matt? Come on, slow down. <laughs> but uh, you know what? The thing that stands out to me there, yes. Jen, as well is, you know, uh, when setting this type of business up, or even when it, you didn't even know what it was, you had very complementary skill sets. Yep. You were interested and had a passion for an industry. Yeah. Um, so you sort of were a level headed in that sense. You know, totally, you had yeah. this sort of interest and your, your goal was probably in the same realm. Yeah. But you had a very hardcore consulting finance yep. background and, and she was more on the sort of marketing yes, and managing creative. brand yep. creative side, mm -hmm. right? How important is having a complementary skill set with your co-founders or business partners? Oh my God, it's massive. 
I mean, you can always hire up against anything that you lack, of course. And, you know, 80% of the time, you have no idea what you're doing. It, that's how I feel, honestly, as an entrepreneur. And 20%, you're like, I got this. Um, but you're wearing so many different hats at all times. But to have someone that is can sort of swim in their own lane independently and you can trust them and respect them for that particular skill is so it's it's everything. Someone you can lean on. Hundred percent, and know that they are making like really sound and really experienced decisions, you know, in a place that they understand. And so I think that that is, and of course, as I said, it's concentric circles. You meet in the middle around anything that really is about, I think, brand. You know, like how do you want the the company to come across, and what does it mean, and where do you see it going, and all those things. Great, but I think you know you cannot underestimate the fact that. Sometimes people think, oh, and, and I'm going to go into business with my best friend, and we are exactly the same, you know, and we we love exactly the same things. And you're like, oh, boy, like, no, no, no. Um, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. I think you really have to be yeah. self-aware to understand I don't have these skills at all inherently. You know, I don't understand these things, and and I really would need someone, a compliment to it, to, to help me think about how this would go to the next level. Mm-hmm. And you can hire around that, right? So if Absolutely. you, if Udi and I, for example, you're excellent, your thing, my thing, yep. we're complementary, but we're missing that third, fourth, fifth thing. Yep. We can hire around that, totally. right? So it's, you know, definitely if anyone is ever thinking about taking that entrepreneurial leap, focus on finding someone who compliments you. It's not terrible to have an exact copy of yourselves, but no. be mindful that it's beneficial to have a team that is skill setted across the board in different areas basically yeah. you can all compliment to each other and also investors if you bring those in they can be a compliment to that too yeah absolutely but segueing back to <laughs> your journey now so we've we've figured out the picture you yep. know it's it's sort of 2010 ish yep. uh, oh my gosh. late 2010s now we're coming into 11 12 i think yep. it was which is interesting because you again talking about luck and timing um was the time of the retail apocalypse yeah have you guys heard about the retail apocalypse? Well, I'm going to tell you. It's Here we happening. go. I'm like, it's happening it's right now. Ty, it is happening. And that's what I want to finish with, actually. Yeah, yeah. But um, here's one of Matt's fun facts. The retail apocalypse was in the late, well, coming into 2010 or so, and specifically in the US, there was this widespread uh, emergence of e-commerce, people mm-hmm. buying things online, which mm-hmm. meant that people didn't go out to the retail stores on their high street as much right. uh, or as often as they previously did because mm-hmm. they were like, oh, this is amazing. Right. Amazon Prime was coming into its days then um, and another sort of quick last mile delivery services. So you had this retail apocalypse, it was called, where right. stores were closing. Now, what happened off the back of that was the pop-up right. industry, specifically yeah. out of LA, mm-hmm. had already been around for a while, but they had all these you know, stores and shop fronts, which were becoming available. Right. And the landlords were like, well, damn, no one's going to take it. So yes. I'll just, instead of taking a 12 to 20, 36 month lease, you know, one to three years, I'm going to rent it out for a month or two, like you would do just, uh, you know, uh, anyone come and try a concept out. Yeah. And you guys, obviously, timing wise, yeah. had maybe picked up on this and saw this. So where did you go with this yeah. new pop up and retail trend? Well, see, it, that was definitely a pivot because where we started was more of like an online marketplace. We were connecting what we called consumers who aspired to be creative with those who were actually living creatively. So, you know, they were able, so people who loved beautiful, special, unique, maybe sometimes handmade goods, like we were putting those two worlds together. And that was fine. And then we started doing it more offline and we started opening stores. And so we had a store on the west side, we had a store on the east side, then very large property oh, developer, of, uh, Toronto. Oh, Toronto. Okay. A very large property developer came to us and said, hey, we love your stores and we love your curation. Can you do something like this in one of our malls? And one second, what's in these stores? What do you sell? It is like, it's like a, a beautiful gift shop. You know, it has home decor, it has candles, it has baby clothing, it has accessories, apparel. It's just all beautiful things. But things that we have, you know, really put an eye towards. Mm-hmm. You know, it's special, it's different. It's really unique. It has a story. I mean, that's the biggest part. It has a story. It comes from a place. It comes from a person. Um, It comes with meaning. So we would create these beautiful shops. And you wouldn't even believe because you could walk in and be like, wow, this is so beautiful. And meanwhile, there's 150 different individuals who are being represented in that store. So it was really special. And this property developer at the time said, can you do a pop-up for us? Sure. And we created this like unreal pop-up in one of the top three malls in North America. I mean, by dollar per square foot. It is like one of the most luxury malls. And it's in Toronto and it's beautiful. It's called Yorkdale. 
and we did their first ever pop-up. It was 3,000 square feet. We did 2,000 square feet of a store, 1,000 square feet in the back where we actually turned it into a workshop and we held DIY, like wreath making, ornament making, you know, all kinds of special activities in the back. That's That was also new in a way. Totally. Yeah. And we also built a little cafe mm. inside this shop in the mall. So people, this is like the first time anyone's seen any of this. And it was kind of blowing people's minds. And actually, that was in 20... 13, mm -hmm. I think it was. And even to the day, you know, people would come to our stores in like 2017, 2018. They'd be like, oh, I'm here because I remember your store, you know, at Yorkdale Mall. And it was from so long ago. So anyway, so we started doing that for property developers. And this is where the pivot started to happen because – Again, the pivot. The, the famous pivot. pivot you said. You're the, you the are the – can I say the queen, queen of, of pivots. pivots? Well, we were just – kind of saying to ourselves, this business model is just not working. It's just not working. The and business model was? Was we were B to C, meaning B2C. we were going directly to the consumer, and we were buying all this inventory, and then we were setting up all Super these stores, yeah. and then we were having more stores and more pop-ups. And at a time, we were doing five, six, seven pop-ups at a time during holiday. We were amassing a bunch of inventory. Then we'd sit on it. We'd have to try to turn it over again. Luckily, it was items that – it was seasonless, you know, it wasn't on trend. So you could sell it six months later, it didn't matter. But we were really starting to, to amass. On Taking all the, all, the in, all the inventory crazy. risk, right? Totally. Yeah. We were basically sitting on a pile of cash. So at a certain point, it came to a head. And we we're like, this this is not going to work anymore. This is this is not. This is, How this many is scary. Years? How many years into this? Week, you know? We were a good five years in. Five years on the wrong <laughs> road. So maybe this was the but, wrong you know, pivot listen, I mentioned earlier. It could have been. Well, this is <laughs> yeah. the thing where it was sort of this – we think we're doing something right. We're mm. clearly doing something right. And we are testing all kinds of things. We tested a lot of things in between. Yet, we were still going down a path where the business model was not right. And so then we came to a point. And by the way, this is the thing that I think entrepreneurs really need to ask themselves. A, a really important question, which is, are you a vitamin or are you a painkiller? Mm. So when you say, Great vitamin, question. you know, you can have it every day. It's probably great to take every day. But if you miss a couple days, it doesn't really matter. It's not going to kill you. But if you're a painkiller, you need the painkiller. You need it. You're going to have to have it. You can't live without it. And you're actually solving a real problem. So in our minds, when we got to this juncture, we were really a vitamin. We were like, we have created these beautiful stores. People really like us. We've done really nice things. And it's, it's like, you know, people are buying stuff. And we have all these stores and all these pop-ups. But if we disappear tomorrow, no one really care. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what we realized was we are a painkiller to these property developers. Because as, as we had been doing these pop-ups, more property developers come to <laughs> Property we're developers yeah. we're coming, <laughs> asking, can you make these pop-ups for us? And finally, we were like, yeah, actually, we can, and we will, but we're a service. We should be a B2B model where we service you, property developer, and we get a fee for you, from you, for setting these up, for going through the hard work of setting these up. And then go back to all of the brands that we've been working with, and at this point, it's been thousands. Mm -hmm and say, we are a painkiller for you because we're gonna give you distribution. That's mm. how we solve your problems. And so we're gonna get a fee from you for putting these things in all of these amazing environments with amazing other companies. And we're not gonna own any of your goods. We're gonna sell them, but once we're done, we're gonna give them back, mm. whatever didn't sell. And that model, just yes, we like jackpot, we figured it out. It was almost like we were doing, so this is again, this pivot thing, it was there all along. Mm. It was there. It was hiding behind something. It was there all along. We sort of realized it. We figured it out. And so from the external perspective, it may not have looked any different, you know, from an end standpoint. But we had totally turned the back end and the inside around. Wow. And that was the final big pivot? Final big pivot. This podcast is a podcast by She Community, right? So She Community are this amazing organization run by Heidi Arvin and a fantastic team who promotes and excel um, inclusion, gender inclusion, gender diversity. However you want to label it, they do a great job in the Nordics and, and internationally um, to help us fix the gender pay gaps, the, the gaps in terms of how long it'll take till uh, globally we have gender equality in terms of everything, right? Which is unfortunately a little bit too long, not in our lifetime. That's like 200 crazy years or something. Um, what does equality mean to you? What does equality 
mean to me? It's a very good question. Wow, loaded. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think for sure it's about um, giving access um, to everybody so that you don't feel like – I think someone made a really interesting analogy about women, um, you know, the struggle with gender equality, it's like the feeling of them running backwards and uphill in high heels. You know, like that's just the kind of things that they're running up against in order to, to be at the same place where men are, to be honest. Um, so I think there's something about leveling the playing field and giving access and opportunities to everyone that are that is fair. Um, and we are really on sadly a really really long way away from that and but um there's so many things that we can do i think these days to accelerate that accelerate the conversation accelerate the discourse you know accelerate actual solutions to get there some of that involves investing which i think is a critical piece of the puzzle and some of that involves policy um and i think that those two things together i mean i think the nordics for example are great you know, beacon of light in terms of what has been done for gender equality historically. Setting the standard. Mm -hmm. nice. Finally, <laughs> COVID. Uh, we can't have this podcast at this time um, without acknowledging that, you know, a lot of people are struggling right now and uh, it doesn't look like necessarily things are getting better anytime soon, this new norm we live in. Mm -hmm. How is the new norm or the new business norm playing out in your business? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um I think there's highs and lows there. So interestingly, I work a lot with small businesses um, and some of the small businesses are actually doing way better than they, you know, than they were pre-COVID, which I think is fascinating. Obviously, it depends on what sort of space they're in. Um, and some of the ones I can think of that are like crushing it are beauty, self-care, athleisure, um, sweats, you know, things that are people are, uh, you know, working from home and they're just more in tune with themselves. And so those industries, which are very easily accessible online, um, they're really doing really well. And they don't, it's just a windfall for them. It's, it's an odd thing. There's obviously so many other small businesses, which kind of goes back to this vitamin painkiller thing. If you are a vitamin before and you're kind of relevant, but we didn't really need you, those are the businesses that are going to struggle the most. Um, and what I tell a lot of the small businesses that I work with now is like, if you can get through this time and really, you know, lean down, like get get really super lean, get your house lean, in order, lean. lean as in like cut all your costs, right. you know, yeah. just get down to the bare minimum. And, you know, then think about how is this – this platform and this framework going to work for me post COVID, you're mm -hmm. set up for success in some ways. So hopefully you can keep the lights on, mm -hmm. um, which is a sad truth, but it's kind of reality. Mm -hmm. Jen, you're a superstar. <laughs> I agree. Lydia, what we learned from today, what did we learn from today? Let's, oh have, a look, let's have a look at what my notes. Let's, let's go learn? through a little oh. summary here and things like that. Things that stood out to me uh, were Experiment and test, mm -hmm. right? Because this pivot, this provocal term pivot is a term that is is used to describe something and someone when they change direction of business or whatever. And and y how we can see, some people don't see that pivot coming. Some people, you know, foresee it, predict it. But the thing that stands out for me is experimenting and testing. The more mm -hmm. experimentation you do, the more testing you do, the more MVPing, minimum vi viable yeah. products testing you do when you're trying to build a business or whatever it might be, the more opportunity you might have to see positive pivots because yeah. pivots aren't necessarily a negative thing ever yeah it's a fork in the road which mm -hmm. gives you two options right mm -hmm. um are you the vitamin or are you the painkiller <laughs> i love that one that's a beautiful comment yeah. jen yeah. describe that one more time <laughs> you definitely want to be a painkiller vitamins are great and you can have them every day um and they're nice to have but if you miss it you know a couple of days it's not going to kill you uh painkillers you need to have you need to have them they solve a real problem um, they're critical to, you know, how you get on your journey, basically. Mm -hmm. So I think that sometimes as a business, you have to look at yourself and be honest. <laughs> you know, sometimes, actually, to be really frank, it's okay to be a vitamin. And you can still be successful. And you can still build a great business. But you have to look at yourself and say to yourself and to your customers, I'm a vitamin, you know. 
And then I think painkillers, though, those are the really meaty, really hard, really complex businesses sometimes that um, that have scale potential beyond because you really are solving a real problem that that people either knew they had or didn't have, by the way. So, And in tough times, you should definitely rethink uh, uh, and become a painkiller. Totally. Yeah. And as always send a letter or an email oh my god always yes. just do yes. it you've got nothing to lose do it i mean your testament to that jen um what was the japanese artist name again oh yeah yoai kusama yoai kusama beautiful example of someone who sent a letter at a time before the world had internet and she got a response and she it changed her career forever right it changed your career and it can change so yours many too. times by the way listening to this at home. so many times thank you for listening everyone have a wonderful day and tune in for our next episode <laughs> in the coming weeks. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Thank you.